Check out our fabulous new podcast, Sunday Night Mystery, every Sunday at 3 p.m. GMT. We delve into unsolved mysteries with gripping tales, thrilling theories, and captivating investigations. From infamous cases to lesser known mysteries, each episode promises suspense and intrigue. Join the conversation and subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform. Sunday Night Mystery, every Sunday from 3 p.m. Hello, good evening. Welcome to our, uh, what is it? A Saturday night episode of Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Welcome to my summer home here in the lovely Costa Calada region of southern Spain, but only for another couple of days because we're about to be heading back. Vicky is busy beavering away, getting all the washing done, ready for our journey home. And uh, we're going to pack the car up and, uh, well, off we'll go, heading back to the ferry. A huge thank you for joining us once again for our regular late night visit to the studio archives of old time radio shows right here in southern Spain. I'm Brett. I'm your host for our nighttime podcast. I've got Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. They're all called Brett's Old Time Radio Show. If you could give us a little, you know, check them out, give us a follow. That would be brilliant. Also, we've got a supporter page at Patreon. Dot com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery. Time now for another adventure with insurance investigator Johnny Dollar. First broadcast on the 19th of September 1951. This one is called the Cuban Jewel Matter. Bing Crosby has been on his summer holiday, but beginning October 3rd, Bing and his crew will return to this their regular time. So join in the fun with Bing Crosby at this time on Wednesday, October 3rd. From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Roger Stern, Dollar. Hello, Mr. Stern. What can I do for you? A job. Be in my office at 8 tomorrow morning and bring a packed suitcase. Sure. Just like those. You're going to Cuba. Oh, hot this time of year. Very. See you at 8, Mr. Stern. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding Company, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cuban jewel matter. Expense account item one, $7.15 mileage and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. Good morning, Dollar. Good morning, Mr. Stern. Sit down. Thanks. Nice. Here it is. This company holds an insurance policy with a Mrs. Lenore Carter. 800000 on her jewels. Uh-huh. Jewels were stolen from Mrs. Carter's safe three months ago. Police haven't been able to turn up the thing. And you've got to pay off, huh? By Monday. What's in Cuba? We got a tip. A man in Cuba knows where the jewels are. He was supposed to have been in on the robbery. Okay. What's his name and where do I find him? William Carnes. He's in jail in Havana. In jail? Yes. Awaiting extradition this weekend. Well, if he's being brought back... Not for the jewel theft. He's wanted in this state on a federal rap. Oh. Police don't even know he was mixed up in the Carter job and we're not telling them. Oh? When he gets back, he's bound to get at least ten years for the federal rap. And you want to know where he stashed the jewels before they put him away? Exactly. He's lived in Cuba on and off over a period of years, and I believe it's reasonable to assume that the jewels are somewhere in Havana. He does a stretch, and when he gets out, he picks up 800,000 jewels. Might be worth 10 years. If we tell the police now and they question him, he'll never open his mouth. He's got to do the 10 years anyway. It's your job to find out where the jewels are before he's extradited. When are they sending an officer down to pick him up? Today or tomorrow. You've got to beat them there. I'll try. There'll be a bonus if you succeed. Like I said, I'll try. <laughs> Expense account item two, eight dollars and ninety cents airfare between New York and Havana, Cuba. When I arrived, I checked through customs and got a tip-hungry cabbie to take me to one of the better hotels where I checked in, put on something cool, drank a tall glass of something cooler, and headed for the local Bastille where Stern had told me William Carnes was interned. Someone to see you, Senor Carnes. Well, I was just making a pot of tea. Just call when you are finished, Senor. Thanks. Hello, Carnes. You bunco fugitive? No, I'm not a cop. I don't think they'll be here to extradite you until late this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Okay. Who are you? I'm a reporter. Yeah? Name's Dollar. Sent down here to get a story. You are, huh? 
I understand they want you on that mail job. You do, huh? No story? No story. And, uh, uh, I stick you again. Uh, 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 I move on. What's that? Uh... I don't know. Uh, uh, that is Senor Carnes. Bueno. Open the door, pig. Uh, si. Hey, what is this? What do you want? You, senor. I want you. What's the idea of the knife? Hmm, the idea, senor, is to slit this pig's throat if he should try to stop us. He held the knife at the police chief's throat while he motioned for Carnes to step out. He was dressed in what used to be a white linen suit, and he stood about five feet four, weighing in at around 200. On top of his head, covering his shaggy black hair, was a straw hat, and stuck in his fat lips was a long black cheroot. Between the smell of garlic and cigar smoke, I began to feel what it might be like to come face to face with a bilious dragon. Who sent you? A friend. You will go now, senor, eh? Okay, thanks. For another. Now get in the cell, pig. <laughs> You. Huh? Si, you. Senor Dollar, you will go too, no? I took a look at his knife, thought about the gun under my arm, then I took a look at his eyes. They made a panther look like the Mona Lisa. Huh? I went. Besides, I didn't want to lose Carnes. As we passed through the squad room, I saw the two guards lying off to the side on the floor. One is only unconscious. The other one tried to make noise. I slit his throat. Yeah. He followed me out on the street and climbed into a car. As he drove away, he smiled a mouthful of yellow teeth and waved one of his stubby arms. I looked around for some help, but the street was nearly deserted. I was about to go back into the jail and release the police chief when I looked down the block and spotted Carnes ducking into a building. I went after him. The sign over the door read Cantina El Gallo, so I slowed down to a sprint and went in. The bar room was small and dark. Posters all over the wall advertised everything from the government lottery to bullfights in High Lie. Carnes was nowhere in sight, so I walked over to a long bar and a lazy bartender moved a wet bar rag slowly up the counter to me. Some for you, Mac. You American? Yeah, but I got sold on siesta. Well, the guy go came in here just before I did. I didn't see nobody. Look, I'm going to make this as painless as possible. A guy named Carnes just romped in here. Whether you know him or not, you couldn't have missed him. He didn't go back out the front door. I don't think I like you. I affect some people that way. Where did he go? I don't know what you're talking about. The guy who just came in here. Eat it. You know, I think you're going to take your siesta early today. Yeah? A long one, but it's going to be uncomfortable. I told you to beat it. When you tell me where I can find Carnes. I got a lot of bottles back here. Swell. Line them up. I'll see if I can shoot the corks out. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. Carnes went up to see Maria. Door at the top of the stairs. Right up the stairs three at a time and forgot to knock. And there, standing in the middle of the room, was the best reason I could think of for upholding the good neighbor policy. South of the border, north of the border, any way you looked at it, the geography was lovely. See? See. Where's Carnes? Don't you think it would have been more polite to knock? I forget my manners when I'm in a hurry. Where's Carnes? I don't know anybody named Carnes. That isn't what the bartender said. Whatever he said, I don't know anybody named Carnes. The bartender also said that Carnes came up here just a little while ago. Senor, you don't look like a man who believes everything he hears. I don't, generally, but I saw Carnes come into the bar. He didn't come out. Now, where is he? I have no idea. I think you're lying. Please leave, senor. Sure. Where's your back door? The way you came in. Bad luck. Where is it? Behind the curtains. Goodbye, senor. Goodbye, senor. I had trouble convincing the bartender. He said Carnes came up here. Okay, I still need Carnes. Do I convince you, too? How do you propose to convince me, senor? Right now, time's important. A hundred dollars worth. I'm sorry, senor. I could be a bully. You might twist my arm. I might. I'm quite stubborn. Good. You're not twisting very hard. My mind was on something else. My lips? A bonus for bringing in Carnes. Yes? Two hundred. Interesting. But not completely? No. Three. That's all my company can afford. Very generous. How old do you know, Carnes? He was the best one around. Uh Uh-huh. Was. Where can I find him? Three hundred dollars. A hundred and fifty now, just to make sure you give me the right address. The Avenida Porfirio, numero tres. Thanks. 
check to see if my hair was on fire and left the room filled with smoke. Downstairs, I found out where to find the Avenida Porfirio and left. Avenida Porfirio is about eight blocks away and a dead-end street. I found number three, a tired building, slumped down in the middle of a lot of other tired buildings. I tried the door and found it locked, so I braced myself against it and as quietly as possible tore it off its hinges. I sprawled in just in time to see Carnes dive for a dresser drawer. He stopped cold when he saw the 38 in my hand. Okay, okay, don't shoot. Not unless you make trouble. That's a big gun for a writer. I've got funny writing habits. I even collect stolen property. Oh. Yeah, oh. $800,000 in jewels. Where is it? We could make a deal. We could, but we won't. Come on, get it. I'm in a nasty mood. You can get at least 500 grand of defense. Stuff's easy to break up. I'll never trace it. Do I have to get rough? No. It's in the bedpost. I'm running out of patience. Okay. Yeah. Gracias, senor. Huh? I will take those, senor. Now, remain facing the window, Mr. Dollar. You're the guy who let me out of jail. Gee. <laughs> How could I find what I want if you are locked in that filthy jail? Eh? <laughs> you had better drop your revolver, Mr. Dollar. Bueno. Now you can kick it over to me, huh? Gracias. Now you, the Jewels. I don't get it. Of course not. I do. Now, pronto. Okay. Gracias. But you said a friend sent you to get me out of jail. See, si, a friend of yours, not mine. I think he had good reason for wanting you out, so I follow. Pretty good reason, I think. Now I be rich. Why'd you let me out? I was supposed to let you out, too. <laughs> now, I do not think you should come after me for a while. I shoot pretty good. Adios, and once more, gracias. Carnes and I both went for the gun in the dresser drawer, and it was like bargain day in Klein's basement until Carnes decided to pick the bedpost and start me on the siesta habit. <clears throat> Turn you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations, the FBI in Peace and War goes to work on the Inside Story, an exciting bout between makers and breakers of the law. You'll enjoy G Man Shepard's latest case, in which the Inside Story is one of slick swindlers come to grips with the nation's number one law enforcement agency. Tomorrow night on CBS Radio at the Star's Address. Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The hunk of metal bedpost had put me down and out. When I finally came around, the room was dark and cold. I pulled myself up on my elbows and tried to focus my eyes. My head ached from the scalp wound over my right ear, and through a window, I could see the moon pushing its way over the tops of the buildings across the street. I felt awful. I'd lost the 800,000 jewels, William Carnes, and enough blood to make a vampire do a shotish. I finally got to my feet, stumbled out of the building, and managed to find my way back to my hotel, where I washed up and put in a call to Roger Stern at the Office of Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding. Yes, Dollar. Have you located the item? I was in touch with the party you sent me to see. He led me to it. Good. Now, a big bundle of garlic that spoke broken English and carried a large gun is now in possession of the item. What? Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'll do my best to locate it. You mean it was taken away from you? To the point of a skull fracture. Where's Carl? There was a slight jailbreak. He's loose and probably trying to find the little guy who helped him escape. The little guy's got the item. I'd like to know who gave you the tip on Carnes. I can't divulge that. I think it's necessary. Either this little guy knew Carnes or the item, or he knew he was going to lead him to it. He busted him out of jail and then followed him. He even knew my name, and when Carnes questioned him, he said that he was paid to release us. What did this little man look like? Oh, five feet four or five, about 200, used a knife on the brake, cut a jailer's throat. Now, look, you better tell... Wait a minute. What is it? The police, senor Dollar. Open the door. What is it? The police, I'll call you back. All right, watch yourself. I intend to. Come on, Dollar, open up. Okay, okay. Hello, Chief. Senor Dollar. You took your time. Yeah. This is Sergeant Evans from the New York Police. Oh, yeah. 
Not too happy. I came down here with extradition papers for William Carnes. I had Carnes until he split my head. I can't help you now. Who was the guy who helped Carnes escape? I have no idea. I think that is a lie, senor. I think not. He knew your name? He called you Senor Dollar? I still don't know who he is. But you got into that jail representing yourself as a newspaper man. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, for what company? Freelance. Right now, I'm working for Intercontinental Indemnity and Bonding. What did you want to see Carnes for? Old claim. Tell me about it. Call Intercontinental. They'll tell you that. I want you to tell me about it, Dollar. This is a confidential assignment. And William Carnes has escaped. You think I helped him? I don't know. Oh, sure. They hired me and said go down to Cuba and spring William Carnes out of jail. What about that guy with the knife? What about him? He knew you. He knew my name. You're splitting hairs. I have to. I'm confused. The pig with the knife killed one of my guards. Then go get him. You're supposed to be a policeman. Look, I think you'd better tell me everything that's happened. <sighs> sure. Sit down. I told Evans everything that had happened from the time that I left the jail, leaving out two details, Maria, the girl in the El Gallo, and the jewels. I simply told Evans that I tailed Carnes to his apartment, and there we had a fight. Now, what did you fight about? I don't think he wanted to go back to jail. He's lying, Sergeant. He knows more than he's telling. And while you're sitting around with your big, fat mouth open, William Carnes and the guy who killed your jailer are running around loose. I do not like the insult, Senor. Look, I got my head caved in trying to catch Carnes for you. The insult goes with the way I feel. Yeah. If you don't like well, it... hold it. Now, take it easy. Well, that's a little tough. If you don't think so, try bleeding for an hour. Okay. Okay, I'm going to check with New York. You stick around, Dollar. If you try to leave Cuba, that headache's going to get worse. The Cuban police chief followed Sergeant Evans out of the door, and I gave them ten minutes' head start before I left the hotel and headed for the El Gallo. The bartender gave me a dirty look that was right in character with his surroundings, and I pulled myself up on a bar stool. Maria was on the other side of the room, moving between the crowded tables and singing something in Spanish about how they put the blame on Maine. She worked her way over to the bar, and when she spotted me, she smiled and used her beautiful brown eyes to point the way up to her room. I smiled back, slid off the bar stool, and went up the stairs at the rear of the cafe. In a few minutes, I heard the applause, and then her footsteps. Hello. Hello. I made myself comfortable. Bueno. Now, if you'll excuse me, I will do the same. It's a pretty dress. But very uncomfortable. I'll change. I'll be out in a moment, huh? There's something to drink on the shelf by the window. Did you find it? Yeah. How about you? Please. I'm sorry there's no ice. Just a formality. Well, it makes it more comfortable, but in the long run, you get comfortable anyway. Well? I feel better. I'm sure you do. Here. Gracias. And how do you feel? I'm with you. Did you find Senor Carnes? Yes, yes, I owe you 150, don't I? Later. Okay. I still do not know your name. Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Mm. You make a good drink, Johnny. Just straight whiskey? And strong. And you made it. And that makes it a good drink. Have you seen Carl since I left you? No. Why do you want him, Johnny? Are you a policeman? Not a bit. I'm an insurance investigator. What do you know about Carnes? Oh, very little. He came to Havana about, oh, three months ago. I met him one night downstairs, and I saw him quite frequently after that. As I told you this afternoon, he, he was the best one around. He ever tell you anything about himself? About his business? How he lived? No, very little. He seemed to have money. Not a great deal, but enough. You have any friends? No. I never saw him with any. He seemed always to be alone. He liked it, Balloon. What about you? Must I explain? You have. I was the only person he spent any time with. And then he was arrested. I believe it was for something he did up in the United States. That's right. At any time, do you remember seeing him with a short Cuban, weight about 200 pounds? No. Johnny, must we talk about Carnes? It'll bother me if I don't get it off my mind. Oh, then by all means, talk. I don't want you to be bothered all evening, Johnny. All right. But have you ever seen a little man that fits that description? If I have, I don't remember. Dirty white suit, straw hat, mean eyes, carries a long knife? No, Johnny. A man like that I would forget anyway. Okay. Johnny, you look discouraged. It happens when you run into a war. I should take that literally, no? No. But you have hurt your head. Not a war? A bedpost. Oh. 
Your friend Carnes, he was swinging it. Let me see. Sure. Oh, John. Poor John. Yeah, poor Johnny. It hurts. I'd almost forgotten about it. Did I help you to forget about it? Immeasurably, but it still hurts a little. Then you shouldn't think about it. I'll need some help. Of course. Huh? I figured. We don't have to answer it. I think we do if you don't want it broken down. Only a policeman sounds like that. Oh, Johnny. Honey, do I look happy? All right, all right. Yeah? I want to talk. You can tell me Stalin and MacArthur just got married and I'd only look bored. All right, let's go. How'd you find me? You were tailed from the hotel. Johnny. I'll be back. Don't make book on it. Only when I've got a winner. I checked with New York. And... Their continental indemnity has no record of having hired you. What? I said they have no record on file of having hired one Johnny Dollar to do anything for him. Roger Stern hired me. I've done a couple of jobs for him in the past. Well, the company thought that might have happened. Why didn't you ask Stern? He's out of town. But I talked with him just before you came over to my Look, hotel. Now, we checked. He told his company he was leaving town for a couple of days. Now, come on. You're under arrest until we do talk to Stern. Did you know where he went? We're checking. He didn't say. Oh, swell. Now, let's go. I want to know all about this job for Intercontinental. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Carnes. Where? He passed by the front door. Come on. You're pulling something Don't be up. stupid. All right, where? There. Look out. Whoops. Evans. Go get him, Evans. Go. Go get him. I went after Carnes. For three reasons I went after him. I was confused, scared, and sore about a good cop named Evans dying in a gutter. Carnes was a block ahead of me when I spotted him again, running fast and looking back over his shoulder. I slammed myself against the building as he tried again. I gave it back to him. He was still going, but he was dragging it. I'd caught him with one, and he stumbled his way into an alley. I forgot about being cautious and went in after him. The alley was too dark to see him, so I put my back against the alley wall and started edging my way forward. Give it up, Conj, you're through. Me to a doctor. You just killed somebody. I'm dying. A doctor, huh? When you tell me a few things. <laughs> what? Please, get a doctor. I'll tell you. Why were you busted out of jail? Who wanted you out? The guy I was in on the Carter job with. He put me up to it. Gave me the combination of the safe. You got the jewels and headed for Cuba. You didn't split with him. No. I found out he was after me, so I turned myself into the law on an old rap. He had me busted out, so I led him to the jewels. It wasn't the little guy with the knife? No. He hired him, too, I guess. Who is he? Stern. Roger Stern. Works for an insurance company. Yeah, I know. Please. Now, look. I... <laughs> okay. You get your duck. You stand up? Carnes. No, I guess you can't. You're not ever going to stand up again. Well, there it was. Roger Stern, the man who'd hired me, was the man I was after. So I got to a phone and I called the Havana airport. The next plane from New York was due in in an hour, and because of my phone call to Stern, it was a good bet he would be on it to protect his interests. I grabbed a cab, and in 15 minutes, I was sitting in it across the street from the airport. The place was alive with Cuban police, but they weren't looking for Stern. They were waiting for Johnny Dollar to try to leave Havana. An hour and five minutes later, my patience paid off when Roger Stern walked through the front doors and climbed into a cab and headed south with my cab right behind him. We drove like that for about 40 minutes until we reached the outskirts of town and stopped on a dirt street fronted by an adobe building. My cab pulled up at a safe distance behind, and I got out and watched Stern walk up to one of the buildings and knock on the door. Someone let him in, and I went around back to see if I could find an unlocked window. I did. I could hear voices coming from the front of the place, so I crawled in and picked my way through the darkness. But, Senor Stern, I do not know what you are talking about. You know what I'm talking about. $800,000 in jewels. 800? 
Oh, 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 where would I get? Stay right at that table. You don't have to point no gun at me. I did what you paid me for. I got Senor Khan to the jail so that Dollar could follow him. Dollar called me last night. He said you took those jewels. Oh, Senor. I think maybe this Dollar was lying. I think maybe... I want those jewels. I do not have them, Senor. I warn you. You do not warn me, Senor. I do not scare of you. You better scare. You wanted for murder. Si. And what are you wanted for? I cut a man's throat, Senor. You and Khan steal the jewels. It seems to me we are both wanted. I'm going to get those jewels. No. Then you do have them. See, si, I have them. But you're not going to have them. I'm going to give you ten. I told you I do not scare by you. I do not scare by nobody. One. You do not kill me. Two. You kill me, you go to jail. You wanted for murder. I'll be helping the police. Three. What about Khan, senor? What if he tells the police? If he does, I'll be in South America. Four. Without the jewels? No. Five. But, senor, you need money. You're going to give it to me. Six. Uh, you do not have the insides to kill me. Seven. Uh, senor, why do we not be practical? Eight. Half for you, half for me. Nine. I should get something. I got them for you. Ten. Okay, okay. Where are they? In my hat. <laughs> hey, you look surprised. A little. Take it off, throw it in the middle of the floor. Si, senor. Don't anybody move. Right here. It happened fast. Stern spun around to face me, and Juan kept reaching for his hat. Stern pointed his gun, and I thought I was going to have to shoot him, but Juan took care of it. As his stubby little arms went past his collar, it came up with that long knife. He'd thrown it, burying it to the hilt between Stern's shoulder blades. Then he went for the gun. And... The little fat man was lying on his back where two of my shots had knocked him. He was as dead as he could get and his eyes were staring up at the ceiling where the last of his cigar smoke still clung to the dusty beams. His straw hat was pushed back, and 800,000 in jewels had spilled out of his leather bag inside and was spread on and around his fat face. Authorities finally straightened it out. It went something like this. Stern needed money. He contacted Carnes and gave him the combination to Mrs. Carter's safe. Carnes got the jewels all right, but he didn't split. He headed for Cuba, but Stern found him and contacted the little killer who turned out to be one Juan Guiardo. Stern then contacted me, and you know the rest. Juan got greedy like Carnes, and everybody got dead for it. Expense account item three. $300 in payment for services rendered by one Maria, uh, I forget the last name, but she was very helpful. Item four, $216.73, hotel bill and miscellaneous. Item five, same as item two, plane fare back to New York. Item six, same as item one, mileage to Hartford. Expense account total, $708.83. Remarks, I have saved intercontinental indemnity, 800000 and Mr. Stern was still an employee when he promised me that bonus. If you think I've earned it, please forward it to my address in Hartford. If it takes more than two weeks to clear, I am returning to Cuba for a vacation. So you may send it to the Cantina El Gallo. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can now be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Ted Osborne, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Nestor Paiva, Lillian Payef, and Stacey Harris. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Defense is your job, my job, the job of every American. To stay free, to be strong and secure, our country needs the help of every citizen. Defense bonds provide that help. They help to make America strong financially. They help to curb inflation 
and they make the individual family more secure. Defense bonds strengthen the military front, the production front, and the economic front. And just as important, buying United States defense bonds helps you by providing you with a safe, sound, profitable investment. Don't forget, defense is your job, too. Buy United States defense bonds. Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad attempts to solve a particularly grim killing tomorrow night. An adopted daughter is the victim on the eve of her engagement party. Her fiancé and family are logical suspects. A loss of memory complicates the case. Plan to listen tomorrow night for Inspector Hearthstone of the Death Squad on most of these same CBS radio stations. The address again? Why, we'll sing it. CBS. For the best. F. Yes, yes, yes. The size that dress is CBS. And remember, Rayburn and Finch tie a string around your sense of rhythm every Friday night on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our latest adventure with insurance investigator Johnny Dollar. More adventure coming tomorrow with The Man Called X. That's uh, going live at 5 p.m. GMT. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a supporter page, patreon.com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery. But for now, thanks for listening. I'll be with you seven days a week, each and every week. And I'll see you tomorrow on Brett's Old Time Radio Show. Love you. Bye. For just £5 a month, you can get early access to all of our podcast episodes, copies of our script, access to further information, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery, £5 a month. That's cheaper than 15 minutes of parking at Bristol Airport. Yeah, I know, it's crazy, isn't it?